Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. So I've just set go, said go here to let everybody come in and get comfortable. And in just a few moments here, we will uh, we will get going with our with our webinar today. Uh, I'm excited to do today's webinar. Uh, three companies that I own and that I follow in the Maven letter that are all proximal to each other, sort of Nevada and Arizona. Um, and certainly I did that by design because I do believe that majors are uh, specifically interested in simple projects and good jurisdictions. And these projects either already are or have the potential to become precisely that. So that's why I invited these three companies to this webinar. Um, I do have Doug Eaton, from GGL, and I have Michael Povey from Gold Basin, and I have Todd Hilditch from Riley Gold on the line with me now. But before we show their fantastic faces, I'm going to do a little talk of my own about what I think is going on in the gold space. I promise I'll keep it short um, because, you know, there's a lot going on, so it could go on for quite some time. Um, the context, obviously, the thing right now is that we're going into a tightening phase. It's funny how. We've been focused on this for months already. And in fact, it is still pretty accommodative out there. In fact, the Fed is actually still buying treasuries, but the end is nigh. Does it have to end? It absolutely does. And that's what this set of charts shows. I mean, it shows the Fed funds rate, which we're all very familiar with, um, which has been, which was slammed to the ground during the financial crisis, stayed near zero for years. Then they tried to inch it up and then they were like, oh, it's not working. And then they were starting to step it back down. They were stepping it back down back then in 2019 because the overall economy just wasn't that strong. And so they were tightening for the sake of tightening at that point. They were raising rates so that they, just to get off zero for the sake of getting off zero. I think that's quite different than what's happening today. And I think that's an important thing to hold on to. Right now, we have a pretty strong economy. We have very low unemployment and good growth. Um, there are threats out there. There are always threats, but I, I think it's important that the fundamentals, the rationale for raising is actually very real right now, um, as opposed to back in uh, 2016, 2017, when the rationale was a little bit tenuous. And so a correction in the stock market um, was the reason, really, that they stopped that tightening cycle. You can see the Fed funds balance sheet at the bottom. It's been a party. The S&P has, has um, profited from that party immensely but yes it absolutely has to end and the reason it has to end is because of inflation inflation at seven percent steals half of your purchasing power in 10 years that's not okay for anybody so yes that has to be fought whether raising the fed's funds rate is a super effective way of fighting inflation we'll see there's lots of debate that's not the point of this call today i don't know how much of inflation comes from trade bottlenecks versus COVID handouts versus stockpiling that happened versus reopening effects. I don't know, we shall see. There's a lot more questions than answers out there and there won't be answers to a bunch of this because COVID has been such a weird thing. But at the end of the day, we have rampant inflation and we have um, pretty strong GDP growth. Like I say, a real, some real reasons that this super accommodative phase has to end. So what does that mean for those of us who are interested in the gold space? It's a good, thing. I, uh, I have two charts here that demonstrate how gold gains with rate hikes, especially early in the cycle. I would have only used the second one, but then Visual Capitalist put out this lovely image just this morning that shows how gold generally performs with a rate hike cycle. And it's a nice visual capture. Uh, and that's what Visual Capitalist does, captures um, financial things in a nice visual form. And you can see that gold often, look, six months after a rate hike, the average gain is 11%. That's fantastic, right? That and that's, I put that up here because it's really important to remember that gold generally gains with rate hikes. Here's the way that I had captured it before Visual Capitalist put out their lovely image. And this goes back far, this goes back to whatever, 1976. Um, and it shows that in general, when you have the start of a tightening cycle with the Fed funds rate, gold goes up. That is, I think, the most important thing to look forward to. And it's not very long, not very far ahead at this point. In fact, it's one month away, which is when the Federal Reserve will have their March meeting. And we are very much expecting that they will raise rates at that point, whether it's 25 basis points, potentially 50 basis points. Both of those are very much on the table. 50 basis points is quite likely. They will hike and it could well be 
um, it could well boost the gains that we are seeing in gold right now. Now, when I say the gains we are seeing in gold right now, it's a reasonably short-term capture, right? Two weeks ago, I would have been like, ah, stupid gold. Um, but in the last two weeks, we've had some nice moves in gold. Um, and I think that the pending tightening cycle is a big part of that. But there's a bigger picture. There's always a bigger picture at play. And I think that this stuff that's on this slide, I'm sorry that there's a lot of words, but what's on this slide is my attempt to, in very brief, capture the bigger picture impact of shifting to tightening after this incredibly accommodative over a decade, right? So there was that short period where they, you know, did Operation Twist, they stopped buying bonds and they tried raising rates and then they dropped rates down again. Really, you know, negating that or excluding that, we've really had over a decade of highly accommodative conditions from the Fed. And now we have a pretty robust economy, very low unemployment, <clears throat> high inflation. These are real reasons to tighten. And the thing to remember with that is not, the first thing to remember is that gold usually gains with tightening. The second thing to remember is that you can't tighten without upsetting an apple cart. I don't know exactly which cart will get upset first and to how, what degree, but it's not going to be just smooth sailing. That's not how it works, right? And so, I mean, John Maudlin here did his capture of it, you know, <clears throat> Wall Street is hooked on super accommodative conditions. And then now the Fed is up against the wall, they have to tighten and that will aggravate someone. Will it be the bond market first? Will, you know, debt service costs be the thing that gets um, pissed off first to be, sorry to use a slightly crude term there, but will that be the thing that gets mad first? I'm not sure. Um, if it is, this chart on the bottom is one to remember. So the thing that is perhaps best correlated with the performance of the S&P is the earnings. And if we have higher debt service costs, then earnings get impacted, right? And so, uh, and so that threatens the direction of the S&P. Uh, but there's other things at play here. It's not just debt service costs that might get mad. We also are seeing already a rotation from growth and growth has been the thing, right? You know, super speculative tech stocks and unicorn IPOs and just big tech have been the story of the broad markets for years now. Um, but those things are already underperforming. And I think it's very important to realize that big tech will underperform in 2022. I was reading about this last week and there's a few numbers that really stood out to me are from 2015 to 2019, Apple grew at 2.7% compounded annually, right? Nice growth rate, pretty sustained. In 2021, Apple grew 33%. And it's partly because, you know, iPad sales grew by 75%. This is a direct impact of COVID, right? Everybody had to teach their kids from home. They had to work from home. Everybody needed tech. And so they, you know, Amazon benefited, Apple benefited, all of the big tech names that drive the S&P really benefited from COVID. And that is unsustainable. It just, we won't have that juice going into big tech this year. So big tech will underperform this year. And I think that will have an impact on the overall valuation of the S&P for sure. It will have an impact on momentum and sentiment. Um, and it's, we're seeing it already in the fact that investors are stepping back from the speculative sides of that. So the, the high, the profitless tech stocks and the unicorn IPOs and stuff, these things are really struggling, have been already for a few months. This is a lot of people are capturing this as a rotation from growth, which has been the thing to value, which is also a common characteristic of a tightening cycle because profits are good and you know, growth just makes sense. It's there, it's an easy bet. And at some point, a growth cycle tips over. And that's when you really don't want to be in the really speculative stuff. So this is happening. This is part of what's at play. And it's it's pertinent to gold investors because gold is definitely on team value, not on team growth, right? So that's sort of the big picture stuff that's going on. Uh, I also want to, I don't talk a lot about technicals, um, but I think this chart, I found this chart pretty compelling. And so I'm including it. This is um, Robert Sin, who's, who's known in, in social media as Goldfinger, great technical analyst, especially in this space. 
he didn't believe that the huge high of August 2020 was as reliable as the high from January. So he drew his downtrend line from January to today. Nice, clear line. And then you can of, of lower highs, but matched with a line of higher lows, which creates that triangle. And then we have in the last week broken decisively up out of that triangle. How much weight you put into technicals is up to you, but I do think that that's an important and, or an interesting chart, certainly to pay attention to. <clears throat> Bottom line, I think that we are fundamentally set up for a move up in gold this year. Um, I'm not going to say exactly when or how fast or any of those things because uh, my crystal ball is broken and I have learned not to make specific predictions because it increases my odds of being wrong. But my big picture prediction is that we are going to do have a nice year in gold. So if that makes sense to you, then what do you do with that? Well, there's lots of things that you can do, but one of the things that I like to do is bet on projects that are going to make discoveries into a good, make discoveries or um, grow assets that are under-recognized and that um, have the potential to really fit the bill in this gold market. And so in this gold market, it's really important to remember that majors and mid-tier <coughs> producers have tons of money they're making lots of money they don't have sufficient project pipelines so they they have not been buying a lot they they're not desperate for production tomorrow but you can't let yourself get to that point you have to buy years in advance so they need to fill their project pipelines they're showing engagement with that talk to companies with more advanced assets and their you know their discussions their confidentiality agreements and whatnot those are really stepping up so they majors need to fill their pipelines and they absolutely prefer good jurisdictions. In the last gold bull market, there was a lot more going into difficult jurisdictions or areas that needed a lot of infrastructure build to create build pro to build big projects, and that did not work out well. There was a lot of other factors at play. It wasn't just like the fault of the jurisdiction, but it definitely means that majors are not particularly interested in having to build super long roads or you know get to isolated places or struggle in jurisdictions where the potential for permitting problems is significant so they prefer good jurisdictions and they want straightforward deposits straightforward in terms of metallurgy in terms of engineering in terms of hopefully permitting they like everybody always likes straightforward as opposed to complicated the market knows all of these things that i just said they're pretty clear and that's why good discoveries and deposits in good jurisdictions with you know good discoveries get, are getting rewarded right now in this market even though as a whole the junior space is still struggling i know my portfolio isn't performing the way i want it to given the price of gold i think that will change but the fact that those good discoveries are getting rewarded is one that i'm holding on to because as the market strengthens that reward will continue and will become more so as the sector as a whole starts to get more interest and support. So with that groundwork laid, let's move into three projects that I think fit the bill that I was just saying here. So they're either have, they are either already are straightforward deposits with potential of scale in good jurisdictions, or they have the potential to become precisely that and jurisdiction is definitely um, definitely um, the key that brings these three together. So to start, please, Todd Hilditch. I would love to ask Todd to show his pretty face and uh, keep us uh, tell us the story of Riley Gold with its projects in Nevada. Todd, take it away. Thanks, Gwen, and thanks for having us uh, today. Really appreciate it. Uh, why Riley Gold? Uh, we're we're active in the gold exploration. Uh, we've got a, a management team from mine finding through to uh, M and A. Uh, we do have two projects located in Nevada, and uh, to Gwen's point, good jurisdiction, safe jurisdiction, a jurisdiction you would take your family on vacation to and not have to worry. Um, we do have activities going on exploration-wise at our two projects, which we'll get into, and we have a tight share structure with about 17% owned by management. Uh, capital structure, we spent a lot of time and energy making sure this was right uh, from the get-go. So we have 32 million shares uh, issued and out, uh, 45 million fully diluted. You can see our warrants and options here on screen. Um, share price-wise, as also as Gwen alluded, you know, we've, in the junior space, we haven't been uh, quite as robust as we'd like to see, but that can be said about most. 
Uh, we do have uh, Paul Stevens and Stevens Management uh, Group involved uh, with us, and uh, we're, we're we're quite proud of the structure and hope to keep it in, in good tact. So Nevada, yeah, not only is it extremely well endowed uh, with a gold uh, from a gold aspect and the uh, sixth largest world producing region, most of that gold within trends. But Nevada as a whole produces up to 5 million ounces a year, very steady. Um, both of our projects are in that area and infrastructure, employment base, uh, it's just, it's one of the best places on earth to, to do business from a mining standpoint. So our two projects, um, the, the details below these, this slide uh, we'll get into, both are between 20 and 25 square kilometers, uh, well positioned near uh, uh, past producing and producing mines. We'll talk a little bit to the work that we've been doing, but these, you know, more or less fell uh, to us uh, through relationships. And uh, Nevada is a big place. There's an amazing amount of great companies working down there. Um, but it's interesting. Sometimes a project, due to gold price, to um, just timing, uh, doesn't get the attention that it needed. Um, and uh, that's the case, I think, in both of our two projects here. So the first one, Tokop, uh, it's 100% owned. It sits sort of between the Tonopah and Beatty uh, districts, an area that's had past producing uh, mines, uh, current producing, you know, near 10 million ounces produced over time. The cores of the world, the Augustas, uh, the Anglos uh, working down in Beatty, which has been a very hot district, is, is sort of the area that we're in within the Walker Lane. So why did we get excited when it first landed with, with us? Um, it's an intrusive related uh, system, uh, gold hosted in shears and in veins, similar to uh, Eagle Mine up at Dublin and, and Fort Knox in Alaska. We, when we first were introduced to this, went to Dr. Richard Silito, uh, along with Ruben Padilla actually, who had worked with some work at uh, Cisco and had spent a little bit of time here before they got taken out in that three-way merger back, I guess about 11 years ago. But what was cool is the first thing we noticed was the historic drilling, 12 meters of two and a half grams per ton, 18 meters of a, a gram and a quarter, uh, trenching eight, 18 meters of almost two grams per ton. So at first blush, it was, a, it was an exciting, geez, how come, how come this isn't being advanced? Um, but again, uh, you know, opportunity and for other reasons, it was sitting on another, a company's books that had moved into the lithium space, uh, as, as a matter of fact. So the first step was, wow, look at these grades. Uh, let's see what else we can find. So historic rock and soil sampling before we got here, um, you know, you can see that this look, it's tough to see on the screen exactly with regards to this map, but there was a fair amount of work done. Um, some of the quartz veins that were northwest in strike uh, up to almost one ounce per ton gold. There were uh, sheeted quartz veins that were up to 10 grams per ton, um, you know, a whole series of eight, nine, 10 gram per ton gold across these vein sets. So obviously that was checking another box besides the, uh, the early stage drilling. Uh, even some of the, the soil sampling, um, from a soil sampling standpoint, up to 1.4 grams per ton, that's high. Um, so, you know, there was another box checked, another part of the exploration uh, piece to uh, really dig in. And that's when we completed on the deal for, for TOCOP. So in particular, uh, first thing we did, we stepped in and we wanted to do some of our own confirmation. And you can tell on the scale here, the main TOCOP area where there's uh, mapped vein sets over about a kilometer, kilometer and a half. Uh, we were getting up to 19 grams per ton, 15 grams per ton. Um, so that was not only matching, but in some cases improving the previous work. Um, some of the channel chip sampling too, across some face uh, broad uh, scale was five meters of five gram per ton. So um, the next box was checked, which was, okay, we've done our own homework. We're now in a very centralized small area of the 20 square kilometer property, but we were getting the same type, if not better grades. A um, little bit of visual gold here that we panned out of one of the samples. So first thing we did as well is we wanted to follow in on the RC drilling that was completed by the previous operator, but we wanted to use core drilling. Um, we announced a 20 hole program. We completed on 12, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but our first three holes came back with spectacular results. 2.6 meters of over nine grams per ton and up to 17 grams per ton over a, over a meter and change. 
So uh, as well as 1.6 grams per ton over five meters. So uh, again, the box was getting checked on the basis that we went in, we were learning more. Um, the previous operator drilled, we felt parallel to veins and we wanted to come across them in a perpendicular nature, but the next box was checked. We're now drilling, um, getting same, if not better grade than we, they were on their uh, drilling. Uh, our sampling program, then we stepped back. We Google Earth back and wanted to get off the main Tokop area. Um, we did over 330 soil samples, 400 rock samples, up to 72 grams per ton. Um, it assisted us in finding other areas on the property that really needed some, some additional attention, not just that main area where we can see and, and touch and feel the vein sets. Um, there was a new gold anomaly down in an area uh, that we found of an epithermal target, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but you know, again, next box checked, we zoomed back and we saw more gold in, in other areas several kilometers away. So where do we sit today? Um, you know, all of, most of the work besides the drilling was in the fall of, uh, of this past year. So September, October, November, December, we are still getting results and information in. And even though this looks like, like a very busy slide, um, it includes previous rock and chip samples, soils, our rock and soils, um, the mapping and structural work that is still a work in progress uh, has not been completed, but you can see here that uh, well, along with the first layer of geophysics, which we're still reinterpreting um, as we speak, it's starting to show that we've got a bit of a district scale opportunity here um, as far down as Cabin, a, a couple of kilometers uh, south of the main Tokop area, uh, northeast, uh, the wells. Uh, Hell's Gate, there's areas that, that definitely need more attention and that's what we're planning on moving forward into, uh, into 2022. Uh, this is one area, now this is very exciting. Um, one person I didn't mention um, uh, when we were going through our uh, beginning stages here of, of who we are is uh, Hillary Jawkins joined us. She worked down in Augusta at Bullfrog and, and mapped the pit. Uh, when she first came up and worked with us, we did a soil grid sample um, down in the southeast of the property, two to three kilometers off the main part. And there's old drill holes that are that are under alluvium. There's nothing that sticks out that says, hey, come drill me. Um, 12 meters of almost a gram per ton um, and six meters of one and a half included. So it's an area that you wouldn't automatically jump to and say, oh, wow, we've got to go drill here. But this is where, and you can see in that picture that um, there's an epithermal veining, veining um, that we're able to sample and where some of the drilling was. So we think we have two systems here on a more district scenario, an intrusive related system, as well as an epithermal system. So progress, uh, I have already talked to February, March, April, up through October. Um, if you wanted to focus in on January, um, we did get our last nine holes in. Um, we do have additional samples yet, yet to come. Um, we're completing the, the gravity survey review as well as the mag survey and putting it all together and expectations are coming up with a drill plan for um, sometime in the next uh, couple quarters. Uh, next slide, we'll move on to our Elephant Country project. Um, we are ex really excited to have this. Um, we call it the Pipeline uh, West Clipper project. Um, it's uh, approximately 25 square kilometer and is unbelievably well uh, situated right next to, in fact, adjoining claim boundary with Nevada Gold Mines, the joint venture of Newmont and uh, Barrick. So if you don't know, um, Nevada Gold Mines and the Cortez District is, is unbelievable. Uh, the gold endowment is 50 million ounces of past production, uh, current reserves and, and resources split between pipeline and uh, Cortez. On this particular map you see down to the very, very south end, which is not uh, labeled, is, um, is Four Mile. And all the way up through uh, our property and the adjoining at Ridgeline and Nevada Gold Mines is, is an extremely great uh, corridor of, of uh, resource, gold resource. This kind of zooms in a little bit, give you an idea how we're somewhat sandwiched between uh, uh, Nevada Gold Mines and their production, um, as well as Ridgeline Minerals who staked up to our Western boundary. Um, and they recently announced a few months ago a joint venture with uh, Nevada Gold Mines, which I believe they're currently drilling now. Um, you know, you can tell that the uh, corridor here runs right, uh, includes all of the, the companies here and, and, and the projects. 
This gets us in a little bit tighter um, to our property boundary uh, where you can see Gold Acres on the map, which is their furthest left um, open pit. Uh, we are 600 meters from the open pit. That particular resource is just short of a million ounces of, uh, of just about three grams per ton as part of Nevada gold mine. But the pipeline mine and the gap mine, which are, are now basically one we were down there recently, it seems to be that they've uh, connected. Um, it's, it's an unbelievable opportunity for us. Our targets will be the same rock formations that uh, the Cortez complex has, which is Horse Canyon, uh, Wind Man and the Roberts Mountain uh, formations. And we will not need to go, in our opinion yet, uh, much deeper than about 700 meters for our target. Okay, so how do we find the wind man? Uh, the wind man is the, the secret layer, the secret sauce, if you will, to the production out in this area. Uh, one historic drill hole was six meters of almost point, uh, 0.7 grams per ton, and that was in the wind man. Um, we are currently uh, reviewing, interpreting, reinterpreting um, several gravity um, surveys, geophysics surveys, um, and they would be designed to look for high angle and, and low angle faults. Um, where you can see in this image, uh, you've got this golden hue around those sort of rectangles. That's the wind man. And the surveys are intended to find those dotted lines, the high angle faults, low angle faults. And where we would look to drill target would be in those red ellipses. Um, you know, it's nothing new. They've been mining for that for years next door at NGM. Um, long story short, with regards to this project, we don't think enough work's been done historically. We don't think enough uh, uh, drilling has been done uh, to deep to deeper areas, um, and that would be our intention. So uh, again, we've sort of talked about what we're doing uh, right now. We'll, our ongoing is uh, geological uh, review, geophysics review, drill logs, core shack samples, etc., um, with the goal of coming up with a phase one drill program, uh, hopefully sometime here in this year. Uh, value proposition is really our company, our management team, which we didn't get a chance to expand upon earlier. Um, please go to the website to check that out. We've got a we've got a strong team. Structure-wise, we're in good shape. Uh, we try to maximize shareholder value with capital allocations. We've got two good projects. Catalyst for the next uh, one, two, three, four, five, six months are pretty heavy. We've got a lot of information coming back to the market, and we look forward to sharing that with you when we do. Thank you very much, and Gwen, for putting this on. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for being part of it, Todd. That's fantastic. All right, I should have mentioned to uh, all of those who are listening that we do we are keen to take questions at the end of the presentations um, for me and or for uh, for the presenters. So certainly uh, use the uh, control panel there to send in your questions. I'm compiling them, and I will make sure to forward them to the appropriate guy. Uh, they all happen to be men today at the end of these presentations. Uh, with that said, I would love to ask Michael Povey, um, who was kind enough to get up in the middle of the night. He's located in Western Australia, um, to get up in the middle of the night to join us here for this event uh, so he can tell us what's going on with Gold Basin. Michael, please take it away. Thanks very much, Gwen. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I guess Gold Basin, um, there's our board as it currently stands. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a mining engineer. Charles is the geological site. John Robbins, many of you will know, is the chairman. So we've got a, we've got a, a good, strong board. And we're also a member of the Discovery Group, which many of you, of course, in Canada will know very, very well. So we're pretty happy about that. And um, I think we'll, we've had some strong support already with regard to our project. I'm think pretty certain we'll have a, a lot stronger support in, over this next year as, we, as we're progressing. Right, so we're situated in northern, uh, northern Arizona, northwest Arizona. We're about 70 miles as the crow flies from, from Vegas. Um, infrastructure all around us, the main highway is only sort of five kilometers away from, from it. The 330 KVA line runs across the top of the lease, in fact. So, um, you know, infrastructure wise and access wise, we really couldn't be um, any better. And, you know, as Todd mentioned previously, you know, between Nevada and Arizona, they you know, regularly rated the top one and two mining jurisdictions in the world. And uh, that includes you know, where I'm from in Western Australia. Um, it's still a, a, a good place to do business and to do exploration. So we've got inside that, we've got currently, it, this kind of fits a, a classic case of what this subject matter is about, about gold being known in the area and uh, now being really looked at. Um, essentially, Gold Basin was an area that was mined to, uh, by the classics of old time of mining in the 1890s through to probably the mid 1930s. The cyclonic deposit we're noting there and the Fry mine, which is in uh, just at the top of that, were 
were probably the most significant ones here, fairly decent grades. The fry, it turned out, was around about 18 grams a tonne, according to the, uh, the, the local government mining engineer who visited that, and uh, the cyclopic was about six grams. But it disappeared off the radar from about 1936, and really nothing happened until the late 1980s, where a couple of companies have a look. They Obviously, gold price was not, not fantastic then, but they didn't really have a, too much of a plan. A number of shallow holes were drilled in the cyclopic deposit, really looking for some extensions of a small pit there. And um, really, they were sort of every which way, probably couldn't take too much from it. Even though there was probably 500 holes, there really wasn't a clear pattern of what was, what was going on. But from that point on, for the last sort of 20 odd years, it's been held by the, the claim owners. Um, they kept the package together. They were mainly a group in New Zealand, strangely enough, until yeah, myself and Charles, and then through the Gold Basin, we're able to consolidate 100% of, of the project area, which is normally 31 square kilometres uh, at the moment. We've got uh, other chunks of ground here, which are uh, currently with the, uh, the BLM, uh, with under application. There are areas that we've picked up, which I'll chat, chat a little bit later due to some of the geophysical work that we, we completed in 2021. Most of the, the current work has been concentrated on a cyclopic deposit, mainly because there was a lot of historical drilling. Um, as I say, we didn't really understand what the structurally was going on until we really completed a, a program of 30 holes at the end of 2019. And then through 2021, we drilled another 103 RC holes. We also put in six uh, diamond core holes as well. Um, primarily on the case of four and for some metallurgical test work, but um, they also have come up with some, you know, confirming some of the, the, the structural things that we're looking at there. So what we what we found really was that through, as you can see there, it's pretty busy. The, this, this particular slide, um, which is not really only saying cyclopic, you've got fry slightly to the north, the ring bear deposit, which we haven't touched yet at all. And we've got these, these uh, other sort of star crosser areas. They're all the rock chip sampling that's, uh, been undertaken. I think we have a database of somewhere like 5,000 of these, if not more. And you can see these are all the touches over one gram. So there's a lot of area that we haven't expanded into yet. And you know that's going to be part of our, our current program that's, that we're, we're going to talk about a little bit more. So what we learned from the drilling program in 2021 is the intersections that we've got this um, from surface layered structure um, it's ox all oxide, nothing else in it. It's uh, completely clean, the tiniest amount of silver, which really is almost less than the gold. And we've got this from surface and we've only really, the average hole depth at the moment is about 90 meters. So we've got this uh, layer upon layer, they pinch and swell, they sort of uh, join into one another, probably hydrostatically controlled, but at the moment we can see this is a north-south axis where we can see this continuity because that's really where the greater density of drilling has occurred. But on the east-west axis, which is coming towards the screen and back towards the stealth, there's a lot less coverage and they were just obvious gaps, which um, you know, we, we basically knew we had to uh, fill in. We had enough information. There was a previously a resource on this project done for an ASX, a dual one, and this, this drilling we probably could have, we definitely could have expanded on that, but we felt well, we've got more drilling to do. There's too, too many obvious gaps, particularly on this east-west axis. And we had multiple targets on the ground as well, which we hadn't even, even touched on yet. So within Gold Basin itself, you can see we've got two primary areas there. You see cyclopic in the, in the central region, which um, I've just sort of covered. We've also got the stealth. Now, the historical drilling, as you can see, has been quite a lot. We've got some good intersections, and we, um, we really, you know, very difficult targeting all these these targets in one go. So we've really worked on the cyclopic, in which we need got an expansion program, which is currently underway, and we've got the stealth area where historical drilling has provided some really decent intersections, as you can see on the right there. You know, we had you know 45 minutes over two grams and 62 there you see over a gram. And all that lease there, uh, the complete stealth target actually lies on private minerals grounds, which we've also got the surface rights to. So we've been pretty, pretty fortunate. And as such, we were able to drill that pretty quickly. And uh, that's actually been underway in the last uh, two weeks or so. We've drilled into the stealth and um, we've got a little break now for some maintenance. And uh, we'll be going back to the, both the stealth and the cyclopic for the targets that um, you know, we've already identified. 
We've also got an area to the south. The area to the south is PLM target. It's always worth in mind, almost all these areas here in blue, we've got um, some drill, not so much on the outer or cyclotic targets to the north here, but the PLM target, the stealth, a little bit to the north, we've got some drill holes, sorry, sorry called drill holes, which are, you know, just showing the same type of layered intersections that we've got through the cyclopic. It's a long way from cyclopic down to uh, a PLM, a PLM target. There is, uh, you know, some three and a half Ks or so. And again, when you look at the drilling there and the historical drilling, it really shows the same type of flat line layered structures, just like we see in both the stealth and the cyclopic to the north. So what have we been up to? In 2021, we actually did a lot, actually. Probably um, we, we managed to uh, complete those 103 holes I mentioned in RC, plus the diamond holes. Four of those PQ core were primarily for metallurgical test work, and um, that's currently with KCA. Um, they're about halfway through the column leach test work that um, we, we, we commissioned. We did have some initial bottle roll tests that we announced a couple of weeks back, um, which showed some you know, good recoveries, really, you know, from essentially from up to about 86%. Nothing nasty, very low cyanide consumption in, 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 the, uh, in the leach, and that's sort of showing up again in the column leach. So we really expect to have some you know, good to very good recoveries. Um, we also completed an era of two, well, essentially two major uh, surveys, the aeromagnetic survey and the hyperspectral survey that we completed those. We haven't put too much of those out because we wanted to do the full package and that includes the IP survey, which is literally just been completed as well. And we're just waiting on the interpretation. But we found that with the hyperspectral survey that we did, it really highlighted so the extra ground that we actually wanted to pick up. Um, so identified some extra targets. So we, we kind of kept that internally. So we actually managed to uh, pick up that ground. And through the aromatic survey, aromatic survey that we did, which was a pretty detailed 3D model, um, we've generated some targets, some deeper targets on the on the, on the property that we're you know very interested in. And the the IP survey really is looking at um, whether these things are the chargeability or not. Um, and we've got some you know, something at depth there which um, may be as interesting as the, the, the what we feel is a very large oxide deposit uh, on on the Gold Basin property. So we, as I said just now, we've really got a um, drill program. We started again in early January with regard to uh, the second phase of our drilling program at Cyclopic. We've got 100, another 100 hot holes that we've targeted, but we're pretty flexible because we're able to look at these things. We've got a large permit now in terms of where we can go. So as the results come in, we may add a bit more to Cyclopic or a bit more to Stealth, but our target is actually drill both of those two, two projects. Uh, they're only 900 metres apart. We really don't know what's going on in between the two deposits. Uh, there's a little bit of an elevation difference, but uh, the 900 meters in between, there's been a few holes which have um, you know, intersected the same type of structures, but they're very few. I mean, literally no more than three or four. So we, um, we, we obviously love to know what's going on between the two and whether they join or not, but certainly at the moment, we've got two parallel deposits of similar length, similar size and scale, which are running essentially on two major structures, the Cyclopic Fort and the Stealth Fort. So, you know, effectively, we've actually completed most of the, um, the all the major work that we need to, apart from the, the drilling. Uh, we, once we've we're fully funded all the way through in terms of our drilling program, the MET test work um, will be completed in the next two months or so. The surveys are being completed there. So as far as we're concerned, we eventually just have to get on with the with the drilling. It, it's a large lateral extent and the grade does vary, as you would expect, between these layers. But the layers seem to be reasonably consistent in terms of there are multiple layers, which sort of, so say, pinch and swell. Grade will vary. Um, you literally can drill 10 metres away from one, uh, one hole and you might have, you know, three metres of a gram or you, know, or you might have to a 10 meters, it's a half a gram, you know, 10 meters away. It's just, just what, what happens there. But overall, it's a large bulk deposit is, uh, is what it's looking like. Looking at it internally, it really is, you know, a, an operation where it's very hard to identify any real waste in the, pro in the project at the moment. There's no easily definable areas, the small layers that sort of creep in between this, uh, the small waste layers, if you like, or lowly mineralized areas between the um, economic mineralization you wouldn't be able to separate out. So it's, it's essentially going to be bulked out. Uh, it, it, 
if drilling shows that to be different in, in the future, when then obviously you know, my opinion will change. But at the moment, it, it's literally something right from the surface, and that has got almost the you know, zero with regard to the stripping ratio. I mean, it's literally like something like 0.4 if you was actually practically to manage it. Our major plan is that we've literally just carry on drilling, keep extending the lateral extent with regard to cyclopic, both east and west. We're going to also expand north towards the Fry Mine, which is another 400 metres to the north. And we've got this large area from stealth, which is really similar type of lengths. We've got at least two kilometres within stealth to drill. And again, it's got extensions, probably extending for at least six kilometres along the major stealth foot that um, has really been untouched. So we've, we've got a big area, multiple targets, and um, you know, a lot of drilling to do in this next uh, six months. Thanks very much for that, uh, Michael. I've written down some questions that I will pester him with um, after we hear from our third presentation today. And for that, I'd love to ask Doug Eaton to uh, step forward. There he is. And uh, take us through the GGL story, which has been quiet, but I think is going to get busier this year. Thanks very much, Gwen. Yeah, you're certainly right. It is going to get busier. We'll work our way through the presentation fairly quickly here. Um, so we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay, so we have a very tight share structure. Uh, and as you can see, the public float is only about 40%. 45 million shares roughly currently outstanding, up to 50 on a fully diluted basis. Currently have about $700,000 in cash, but that will grow shortly. So uh, GGL has been known for many, many years as a diamond explorer in the Northwest Territories. But uh, what's important for today's talk is we've pivoted and we're now focusing most of our efforts uh, on a, a gold project that we picked up in the Walker Lane of Nevada. It's called Gold Point. Okay, again, we're uh, midway approximately between uh, the, the Reno and Las Vegas. The area traditionally has been known as a high-grade gold silver producer. The initial acquisition we had had two former producers on it of consequence, but we've consolidated our land package and there's now actually four former producers on our, on our claim block. It's directly road accessible, the power to site. Probably the most important thing to about this project is it's seen almost no modern exploration. The last production was in the 1960s. Um, since that time, the claim ownership was highly fragmented. And aside from a very small amount of underground sampling done in the 1980s, there was no work done until we acquired the project. It's truly a camp scale uh, opportunity. Uh, and I think as we go through the slides, you'll, you'll understand that. And definitely our target is more than a million ounces of cyanide recoverable material. Okay, history. Uh, past work showed that there was about 92 to 98% of the gold recoverable by cyanidation and about 53% to 80 plus percent uh, for silver. Um, most of the sampling was done, or uh, the only recent sampling was done in the 1980s. There was 35 samples taken from uh, the underground workings and they averaged uh, about 12 grams per ton gold, uh, pretty impressive. But what was important was that the old timers, because all of the production was from underground and it was all based on high grade mining, there was a lot of areas of low grade that were exposed in the underground workings uh, and in surface cuts that, were, that wasn't appreciated. And as we worked, we found lots of material that's creating uh, a gram to uh, five or six grams, which would have been of very little interest to, to the old timers. So the small scale production in the past occurred from the 1880s up till 1962. Uh, the estimate from the two original workings on the, the core property was about 75,000 ounces of recovery. Cutoff grades supposedly were uh, about 10 grams per ton. And uh, the workings extend to a depth of 275 meters vertically below surface. And to the base of those workings, everything is dry and oxidized. So we've got a, a hugely deep weathering profile, which gives us potential for, you know, excellent uh, cyanidation recovery, uh, you know, if we find a deposit of some size. Typically, or sorry, right now, there's about 17 veins that are known, uh, but we're adding to that every time we go to the property. Okay, uh, so what is the potential here? We can, can, we can obviously look at the existing soaps. Uh, there's lots of material left behind uh, adjacent to those slopes. We know that uh, those open, many of the slopes are open 
down dip for extension, and we certainly can look at that possibility. We know that the vein systems extend for kilometers along strikes, so we can certainly look uh, along strike of the main workings and find uh, new areas. There's certainly evidence of secondary veins that parallel the main structures that were overlooked by the earlier workers. And uh, we can also look out underneath overburden covered areas. Th those are the vein structures, but we've also identified potential for intrusion related bulk tonnage targets. And you'll see some evidence of that in a few moments. Okay, um, the underground uh, sampling, uh, you know, our initial work, uh, we went in and uh, it turned out that the Great Western Mine, one of the producers on, the, on our core property was open and really quite easily uh, rehabilitated. So we went in and did underground sampling there. Uh, we did a lot of surface sampling, and uh, that included both prospecting and rock sampling, and some soil GKM. We did airborne uh, magnetics and, and radiometrics, which we'll, we'll be doing more of that shortly. And we drilled uh, some reverse circulation holes in and around the Great Western, not because we thought it was necessarily the best target, but we had some geologic concepts that we wanted to test and that's where we were able to correlate the uh, percussion results to the underground uh, sampling results. So we uh, did our first work there. So we also did LIDAR surveys, which were very important. They uh, identified structural zones, both on our properties and nearby. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the nearby in, in a moment. So there, there's what our property looked like initially. You can see that there are veins, the Orleans vein and the Great Western. Those were where the two producing veins were, were located. There's a big uh, overburden covered area between there and an area out to the uh, to the east where, uh, where the Horn Silver American workings were. So we did a little bit of soil geochem just to see if it would work and we were able to pick up the known workings out to the west and a number of targets that uh, were nearby uh, which uh, didn't have historic workings on them. So it gave us confidence that uh, soil geochem will work going forward. The rock sampling, as you can see, we, we worked uh, principally in and around the, the known workings, but we very quickly identified a number of additional claims, which stimulated us to extend our claim block very dramatically. We, in fact, we more than quadrupled the land size of our land package, and we made a number of discoveries out to the west of the known workings. As we made our, uh, expanded our claim positions, we picked up patented claims. Uh, which covered the Grand Central Mine and the Horn Silver Mine. Uh, that's very important for uh, ease of exploration. The work to the west began to look at an intrusive uh, Jurassic Age intrusion, in addition to the, the older metasedimentary rocks, which host most of the known veins. And we've now found vein sets that are localized along the contact area and extend into the intrusion which begins to suggest to us that we have quite a bit of potential for, uh, for an intrusion hosted system, as well as the mesothermal veins, which most of the work has been done on. Uh, about 60% uh, of the property is covered by uh, overburden, and uh, looking underneath that is going to be one of the key parts of our work going forward. Okay, so we drilled, we drilled uh, last fall. It took quite a while to get the results back. What was important from that is that we, we were able to identify you know, or, or confirm that the ore chutes extended belong, below the workings. We were also made a quite an interesting discovery along strike in hole 12. In fact, that was the widest intercept. It was 12 meters of 0.22 gold and, and some silver for 2.4 gold equivalent. It's uh, you know not the best hole that we drilled, but it but it it was a very important area because it's uh, out beyond the end of the known workings, and it, it also when we drilled those holes we encountered a number of parallel structures, which the old timers didn't appreciate, and we found that a number of the the intercepts were quite a bit thicker than the uh, than what was explored with the underground workings. So we know that we have areas here both. Uh, a long strike and, and right in the area, the, the workings where, you know, I think we have open pit potential because the mineralization extends right up to surface. So we will be doing quite a bit more work along those vein sets to determine whether or not there, or how many parallel veins there, there actually are. So that, that illustrates that. You can see the, the main workings uh, going down and the, uh, you know, the, the, the vein that was explored and mined. 
but you can see intercepts shown in, in gold out off the sides where we've encountered other veins that weren't known to the old timers. And for example, the one up near surface is a couple of grams. Uh, we re had indications of it from our surface sampling, but certainly the old timers didn't follow it down. And you can see from the, the image there, the workings are, are really quite open. So that's a, a section of the, where those results are on the Great Western. You can see that we've got uh, hits along the known ore shoots, uh, but we also have intercepts out along straight. As we go forward, uh, you know, we, we stalled our program for uh, several months because we wanted to consolidate the land package. So we grew from an area near the core, which uh, was very limited in size, to the point where we now have uh, almost 5,000 acres under, under claim. All of the new ground that we acquire is owned 100% by us. The original core areas, we can acquire 100% in most of it and uh, subject only to very limited uh, uh, NSRs. So we're, we're in very good shape with our land package now. So I mentioned earlier that we had indications that we have intrusion-related type mineralization. So you can see in especially the uh, molybdenum and lead results, the, the vectoring lines, uh, where we're seeing higher numbers to the west that we don't see in the gold and silver. And that's, uh, that's important because it, it should suggest that the, the pluton may have been the main driver for the mineralization and out underneath the overburden cover to the west, I think we've got a, a very interesting exploration target. So where are we going from here? Uh, we've got a large part of our property is covered by, uh, by overburden, as I said. Uh, we'll be looking you know, at the, that area very closely uh, to see what's underneath the cover. We'll certainly be looking along the, uh, the contact area between the pluton and the metasediments where we're seeing evidence of multiple vein sets, the stock work potential, uh, and that I think is one of the areas where you know bulk, a real bulk tonnage system could could evolve. We'll definitely be looking for other parallel structures to see if we can put together areas of veining which are close enough together that they can be open pitted. Certainly, we know that there are some very rich ore shoots left at depth where they last mined in the 1960s. They were mining, uh, averaging over an ounce per ton, and uh, those open those workings are still open to depth. Uh, so we, we certainly have some, some very good high-grade potential we have to look at. And uh, one of the positive features of the gravity data suggests that the overburden depth is very shallow. So uh, it shouldn't be a major impediment to, uh, to exploration as we explore some of the, the overburden covered areas. So what are our next steps? We've got uh, airborne magnetic and uh, radiometric surveys that uh, uh, hope to have completed here shortly and, and the interpretation done. And that'll be followed very quickly by uh, detailed mapping uh, and both the underground uh, and the surface structural mapping. Uh, we'll be doing some more soil geochem along the trend. We expect to begin a rehabilitation of the underground uh, at the Orleans, Grand Central and Horn Mines. Uh, that'll allow us to get a better idea of what's still in those workings. And it'll also give us a, a more complete structural story for the whole property. And uh, finally, we'll be launching into an RC program for sure uh, that'll be looking at the bulk tonnage potential to the, to the west and taking a better look at uh, some of the structural story in and around the, uh, the Orleans mine and some, some of the other producers. Uh, we've been held up waiting for approval from Bureau of Lands to, for our work on the Orleans, and that uh, that's now nearing completion. Uh, so that that's why we haven't done more work in around what was the main producing mine. We have no impediments on the uh, Grand Central and the Horn Silver Mines. They're on patent and claims, so we can we can get onto those uh, right away. So basically, in the next, uh, the takeaways for you here are we have one of the deepest weathering profiles I've ever seen which is fantastic. It means that the metallurgy on this should be exceptional. Uh, we have an area that's seen very little historic workings and we're really gonna ramp up now that we've got our original surveys and our claim consolidation done. Uh, we're gonna be very aggressive in the next few months in, uh, in looking at this target. We have underground workings that we're gonna be able to uh, reaccess, resample, and potentially drill uh, long hole off of that to evaluate stopes that are that are unmined and ore shoots that extend off of them 
and in many cases the adjacent wall rocks which we think are are also of a grade that would be attractive at the present time in other words many of the historic slopes were much narrower than the way they'd be mined today and in fact our drilling showed that several of the the areas are seven to 12 meters wide so we, we think we can have some pretty substantial production from underground if we choose to go that way bottom line is all the right features are in place and uh, GGL intends to be very aggressive in the next the next few months. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. If the, if all three presenters want to turn their cameras on and join us again, uh, I've got some questions to run through. Um, Doug, we were just you were just presenting, so why don't I uh, stick with the GGL story uh, for the first line of questions? Start with a call it mundane, but you did say something right off the bat about how. You don't have a ton of money in the bank right now, but you expect to address that shortly. And um, there's certainly people who are interested in that. So uh, any anything you're going to say about that? Any more light you want to shine on Just that? that uh, we, yeah, thanks, Gwen. We have, we, we have a director's meeting here shortly. We'll be finalizing our expiration uh, budgets, and, and I expect to raise more money. I never like to run the treasury down too low. And uh, I'd love to have a higher stock price, but... Uh, it, the world is what it is, but I think it's a great opportunity for people who who want to get uh, an interest in a what I think is going to be a very exciting play at a time that uh, all the stars are aligned for for gold. I, I think that we have a lot of upside potential. Well, I started talking to you about this asset over a year ago, and I mean, you were pretty excited then about the deep weathering profile, so oxide to depth you know, grade in these mines, which is, you know, tapped some very impressive grades. So like the remnant mineralization right around these mines. Now, a year later, there's been all, you had such a delay trying to get the rest of the land, which is sort of a story in and of itself. I'm sure you could talk for a while about the yeah. challenges and process of trying to get land from longtime holders in Nevada. Um, <laughs> but how do you, how has your level of interest or excitement about this story evolved over the year, right? Since since you first sort of... I, 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 sometimes I, I always feel like I'm a bit of a cold fish when I present, but I, I my enthusiasm level right now, Gwen, is, is substantially higher than it was when we first talked. Uh, underground mining, uh, you know, mines would be interesting, but they have limited potential for, for tonnage. And what we've found in the last year is that because of these parallel structures, um, I, I think we have potential uh, for, for open pit areas and larger scale production in and around the existing veins. And the work that's been done out to the west has shown that uh, we have potential for an entire different system, uh, a much bigger, more structurally complex. There's at least a couple sets of veins. And I think we have potential out there for an intrusion hosted bulk tonnage target that could could have potential for much more than our original targeted one million ounces of leachable material. It's funny how familiar that sounds. There's another company at this in this webinar who started with a vein target and is or anyways intrusion sheeted vein style target and now there's other you know vein type targets on the on the property. That's Riley. But Doug, one more question. Um, so now you've got. The land that you need, um, a lot more information about these parallel structures and um, this, you know, intrusion type target. Like I said, last year you guys were limited in what you could do because you were working so hard to expand the land position, and that needed to happen before, you know, you did a bunch more work and that extra land got more expensive as a result. Uh, what kind of scale of program? I know you haven't made that determination yet, but like, will it be dramatically different this year than last year? Yeah, it, it. I think it's going to be probably done in two phases, Gwen. The I'll call the first phase uh, pre-drilling, -pre if you want. Um, and I think that'll have a budget of somewhere around three quarters of a million dollars. It'll include uh, selected soil sampling in areas that we that we think that soil sampling will be beneficial. That'll include the geophysical survey I mentioned. The uh, it's a airborne radiometrics, magnetics, and uh, electromagnetics. So we. We'll get a lot of information out of that. Um, structural mapping for sure, because it's very important. We get a really good grasp on uh, what direction to drill the drill our holes and optimize that. Uh, but it'll also include the rehabilitation of the underground and the underground sampling programs, which we don't dare drill around uh, any of those workings until we have really good underground maps. Uh, we'll do 
underground LIDAR to get a really good grasp of where the openings are so we don't waste any holes. And ideally, like I said, if uh, if the workings are in as good a shape as what the uh, Great Western is, we can drill a long hole off of them, which really reduces the length of uh, some of the percussion holes that we might have to drill from surface. So, you know, we we want to get all that done be before we even think about drilling, doing the rotary drill program. Gotcha. Uh, quickly, um, I know this, I referenced it already, trying to consolidate the land. and. It was a big process for you. And I mean, everything you just described is the pre-drilling process is also, you know, that's a lot of work. It's a good reminder of how much it takes to get an asset really ready for drilling, which is what the market always wants. Drill, drill, drill. Is there one short story you can tell about the uh, process of getting the land to, to give people a little insight into what it is yeah. to try and consolidate well, a land in Nevada? Yeah, um, the, the, the claims we staked were the easy part. Um, it was right. picking up the, the patented claims in the, the, the case of one of the properties, the first people we approached claimed that they owned it 100%. And as we did a deeper dive into it, we realized that uh, in fact, there were uh, three landholder owners and uh, negotiations of course were very complex. You, you don't want to purchase one portion of it before you have a pretty good lock on the rest of it. So the, you know you you basically <laughs> we basically had to to acquire all of our all of our land uh, and have everything completed before we could even announce the first portion of the acquisition because we didn't want to tell the uncompleted ones what we were paying for the rest of it so it was trying it was trying <laughs> we, so we, it, we believe you there was a lot of certified letters and. Uh, uh, you know, tr just trying to even get a current addresses for the owners. It was very challenging. Gotcha. Right. All of the, uh, I often say that junior explorers are like the, the classic analogy of the duck, right? It looks so simple, just like gliding along. And then underneath, it's just, there's so much going on that that, that often is not apparent um, unless yeah. you dive in a bit more. Michael, let's move. Uh, we'll go backwards, talk a little bit about Gold Basin. What I love about this project is literally the layout of the mineralization, right? That it is, and you got into this at the end of your presentation. It is just at surface. It's these layers that are close together. There's hardly any unmineralized material in between. Um, and it's got good metallurgy and it's just right there. And there's all this potential yeah. to expand. Um, and that must be, I mean, you are a mining engineer, so that must be the thing that attracted you to this asset off the bat. Well, yes, well, initially we didn't know, really. I mean, the, we had this large database, mainly shallow holes, so really the average depth is about 50 metres, but over a 13 kilometre strike length, they, you know, and the, the, the guys in the 90s were just haphazard. They really didn't know what was going on. So they were trying to extend the pit, as I said. So they put you know, holes east and west and vertical. And there was a, just a big combination. And so it was quite hard. But once we'd sort of straightened up with initially, I think the drilling in um, the 30 holes that we put in in the end of 2019, we got a bit of a clue. And then through the over 100 holes that we did last year, it became pretty obvious what was going on. Um, and then we were able to tie in yeah, you would look at the historical holes and say, oh, right, you know, um, that's that's what it is. You know, you can see where they add in now. But more importantly, it's um, the same thing to the south. The PLM deposits got um, about 30 holes in um, and they match up exactly. In fact, the elevations are from the, the top of the deposit to the south. There's an elevation difference between the PLM deposit, the cyclopic and the stealth. And probably just the weathering profile, to be honest. But it's just, you can see the top of one, the layers match up the same sort of ele elevations at the bottom of the cyclopic and the top of the cyclopic, they match up with the, the lower ones at, at, at stealth. So we've got this advantage that we've got over 500 historic holes and while we can't use those, some of them might be usable because they're pretty good quality, others weren't in terms of their logs and, and, and positions or what have you. So we can use them internally to get a, an idea. But what, what we're seeing literally is no real boundaries on the mineralization. There's nothing that's kind of, there's no logical or geological structures that stop this thing from expanding both east and west and north and south. Far from it. In fact, every indication is that the Fry Mine to the north, which has only got one hole in there, which we can see, but there was an historical record, beautiful sort of little write up from the 
the government mining engineer in 1936 where they described how much activity went on and it, that was much larger than I thought it was. So yeah, that's some 400 meters north of the, of the last hole we put in Cyclopic. And um, yeah, so it's it's bulk target. It's from surface, as I said, you know, um, it, it, you can only look at it as one way as, a, as a, an open pit and the, the size will just depend on how much more we expand. But there's literally no reason at the moment we can see why it doesn't extend, you know, at least a kilometre east where we've got a drill hole sticking out there, you know, and we've got this area which is a stealth. So it is, I keep saying this, for you, it does feel a bit like Christmas in terms of a deposit because, you know, it, you know short of, you know, you know, logic dictates there may be the breaks in there and everything else, but at the moment we're not finding them. It's just we have a lot of drilling to do. That's that's the, the, the reality. It's a large area. And it's a lot of drilling, so we've just got to logically expand cyclonic that we know about already. We have there was something like 60 holes in the stealth deposit historically, which show that that's very healthy, you know, with regard to grades and and uh, structure there. But we have to look at it as if we're starting from scratch, given the nature of there are historical holes. So if you like, we're unlike some of the chaps here who are sort of doing not much more sort of base exploration. We are do have the advantage that there are a number of targets which have already had some historical drilling that now makes sense to us um, and we can look at those as a, as a, each one each one as a stage exploration in, in terms of drilling and when it came to the geophysics which i mentioned we did a full suite of this with this ip which is going to add into it um, so we're pretty happy what 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 we've found out from that we, as we said it was enough information particularly with this hyperspectral survey we did for us to actually peg some extra ground which is uh doug was saying was Bit of a learning process, um, in learning how to do that in um, in Arizona as well. Not quite as easy as it is here, where we can just go online and, <laughs> and pick the blocks we want. So um, uh, that was a little bit of a, an effort, uh, which Charles must take most of the credit for there. Um, yeah, and and similarly, we you know we've reached agreement. Um, well, it's uh, yeah, we're finalising things with lawyers with with one of the prospectors there, which we've had the ground for 50 years, and and like Doug was saying. You know, it was a partnership and most people have died and then the children are involved, you know, and there's a whole host of things. But, um, you know, we're pretty confident that will be sorted as well. So that's pretty good. So we've expanded the land package there as well. So, it, like you say, it's just it's open in most directions and the lots of evidence of, you know, potential for continuity and no reason to think that it isn't. So that brings up the sort of classic question that some that a project at your stage faces which is when do you pin a number on it right you have a lot of data um, and in some ways it's easier to market a story once you can say we have this many ounces and it's at surface and blah 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 yeah. We've got a and yet it's also hard to make that decision because you still see a lot more ground that you want to drill it's interesting isn't it i mean it was a recent uh, recent sale of a company which um didn't have didn't put out a resource which uh, went very well was, yeah i heard about it <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, it's hard to know exactly. I, I, I the, the um, we're obviously planning on one this year with this current drill program, but you do you do get this thing where where I mean, if you look at the drilling last year, I mean, essentially ninety percent of the of the drill holes all hit mineralisation. You know, we, it's, it's yeah. such a high success rate. Certainly not used to that in this part of the world. So you know, we got this expansion program. So. The, the short answer is we probably we've been, we've been in a position to to have a resource out there. I just I just you know, when do you stop? I'm kind of interested in just keep expanding it really. And the more you look, you know, you chat about it. More I look at these things, the more excited I get about it because it's sort of you know it just you see it you see that there's a mine there. I really see there's a mine already. Internal numbers show that's the case. I keep saying it, it really depends how big this is. It's an open pit. Um, it's got everything going for it in terms of infrastructure, in, in, where it is, you know, and, um, you know, a heat leachable oxide deposit in that part of the world is frankly fantastic. And we've just got this continued growth. So, as I said, we've got, we've got a 1.4 million drilling program underway. We drilled 22 holes in January. There's a little break for maintenance. They'll be coming back. We may put a second rig on there just to speed it up a little bit. And that will depend on, on availability. So we've got, so we're cash in the bank to do all of that, you know, through and um, looking at that, we'll probably be finishing up, you know, wait, it's going probably mid-April, I would, I would guess, uh, maybe late April. And then, you know, we'll look at the results from there and um, and see how we are. 
it is one of these things though where you we will continuously see the gaps because we can't fill in the kilometer each way yet you know but it's a nice problem to have to be honest with you Lee, so. fair enough okay nice to hear uh yeah that, that's a clear plan and uh get to the end of this program and see if it's time to make a count um yep. in the interest of time i'm going to move to todd uh, everybody's been uh, online already for an hour and a quarter here and i respect people's time so let's ask todd a few questions here Todd, looking back on your first year of work at the at the project, I mean, there's been a range of stuff, of, of kinds of results or of information that's come in. If you could pick one thing that stands out from that range of results that gets you the most excited or that has, yeah, that has changed the story in a positive way the most for you, what would that be? That's a great question. Um, I would say the the... The boxes that were checked with high graded surface, high grade subsurface, and then some of the iterations, <clears throat> I don't think there's one specific pinpoint. Um, I listened to, to Doug um, and M Michael actually, and, and, I, and I picked things out of what they speak to, and we have very common ground. I don't know if you could say that about every uh, you know, junior that exists. Uh, Doug, I could probably throw a rock over to Gold Point from where we are. So we're, we're closer than most people on this webinar would probably think. And, we should probably have a beer one day and, and break some bread. But it's it's to, to me and I think to our team, which we didn't get a chance to go into, whether it be Charlie that spent 22, 23 years with Barrick and, and Hillary, um, who has great history, uh, William, our chairman, who was, you know, has found diamonds the size of tennis balls in uh, Botswana. Um, I think it's it's the iterations. So. And, and as we're moving forward from that first initial sample program, drill program, layered on top of the old work, now we're just getting the geophysics in it so early, can't really get too crazy about it. But it just seems to be adding layers of interest and areas that we can advance to, similar to what Doug had commented on with regards to uh, the intrusive related and the pluton. I mean, the, I mentioned in our presentation that we had a 20-hole drill program announced and we did 12. Uh, part of the reason for that was the definition of insanity. We see the mapped veins, we drilled them, we got the results we were expecting. It's okay, there's no point in continuing to drill that. Let's let's use some of that you know, budget onto to other items to try to build the story. The hydro uh, spectral uh, um, work that, that Michael talked about, we've done some of that as well, it wasn't in our slide deck, but that has um, caused us to be cognizant of other maybe land and other items that we need to, to be paying attention to. So I think it's iterations. Gotcha, okay. Um, you mentioned Hillary um, in well, when you were doing your presentation. Uh, you and I sat down with her a, couple, a month or two ago. Um, do you want to talk about the contribution that she's made to this to this asset and like to how it's progressing? Because it seemed to me like it was uh, that she's been a pretty important addition to the team. She's been a great addition to the team. I mean, but the team you know certainly started with with Charlie uh, and his massive experience with Barrick. Um, and, you know, getting people, I think both guys will appreciate this and the whole sector will appreciate it. Our sector has been so busy, whether it's a drill rig or we're trying to find people is extremely hard. I mean, those are good areas to find good people, but good people have good jobs already. So Charlie was fortunate enough to, to come across Hillary and uh, we were fortunate enough to have Hillary come on. I mean, she had last work down in Augusta, down in, in Beatty. Uh, you know, map some of the bullfrog mine, et cetera. And, uh, and it was her keen eye that what she saw there and is, is adding a lot of value to the sort of secondary, not just intrusive related system that we're seeing several two, three kilometers on our Southeast where we're seeing this epithermal type. So her, her contribution has been great. Uh, Charlie's contribution has been great. You know, I'd like to say I have a contribution that's great, but they're the, they're the definitely the smarter of, uh, of the threesome here. So um, I'm just happy to have everybody on board. We all have our roles to play. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so you need, there's obviously you're gonna be keen to do a reasonable amount of drilling this year. The details yet to be determined once you get more information in of this iterative process, like you say. Do you wanna talk just a bit about, uh, and I could have asked any of the guys this, cause I think it'll be, the answers will be similar, but about sort of the cost per meter and the ease of operating down there. Do you know the cost per meter that it is for you to drill? 
I'm going to plead the fifth, not because I can't answer your question. Um, we had some difficult drilling in the first part that caused hey, us some, some uh, we had to change out rigs and, uh, uh, you know, we weren't drilling, you know, we weren't uh, sort of bringing this name in, I think Michael alluded to it, but we weren't doing great bear type numbers, 100,000 feet of drilling or, you know, or, or someone else would. So, you know, we, we have to deal with where we can be fit in and sometimes you pay more for that. So. I'll plead the fifth on the exact number uh, because that might hurt me in negotiation on our next round or Charlie, but um, <laughs> it's not cheap uh, when you're doing smaller programs. Oh, cool. What's going on about that? Yes, this is true. Fair enough. Um, okay, I had one specific question. Obvious, I mean, I referenced that the junior space has struggled despite a fantastic gold price, blah, blah, blah. Um, Riley Gold is down, as are probably all of these stocks. I, I'm not even sure. Um, Someone specifically asked, are you buying, Todd? Uh, so, you know, there's people out there, there's investors out there who pay a lot of attention to insider buying for good reason. So, yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if you're buying. It's almost like you knew the answer or, or whoever asked the question knew the answer. Uh, I bought 35,000 shares on Friday. I don't know if it's filed yet. It should have been filed today or tomorrow. But, but so <laughs> I guess the answer is yes. Um, but no one would know that because I don't think it's even been filed yet. There you go. So, yeah. There's a very specific answer to a very specific question. <laughs> in our in our sector, it's it's. I mean, I'm sure the other guys do the same thing. I mean, you know, um, when you have a couple extra bucks, if you believe in what you're doing, you you know, you try to pick away when you can. Um, and we're in a lot a lot of times we're in blackout and grayout times because of financials or. I mean, I think Doug alluded to it. You know, the the time to get assay results out was was and is ridiculously long. Um, and it, in some ways it kind of helped us in a way because we finished drilling sort of end of August, beginning of September, and we had to wait four and a half months to get everything out. And during that time, it allowed us to do a whole bunch of other iterations of work that was you know, desperately needed to add to the, to the understanding of what we're going to be doing out there. But at the same time, it also put us in blackout periods that you can't participate all the time. So. I do what I can when I can. Uh, I can't come to work thinking uh, other than the fact that we've got something great. Otherwise, I might as well, you know, push it off and go do something else. That's uh, that. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I, I agree. I like that you mentioned the blackout periods because they're folks in management at junior companies are under blackout, which means they can't buy stock more often than you might think. It's a lot of the time that they actually yeah. can't be active in the market. And with that, um. Thank you so much to our audience. We're glad you're interested. All of these gentlemen are easily available or easy to find, and I'm sure would be happy to entertain whatever questions you might have. Um, pick up the phone and have a conversation with you if you're interested in their stories. Um, I am also easy to find at my website. Um, so you can do it through this webinar platform or you can uh, find us on our various websites. So thanks to the audience for your interest and um, for your time today. And thanks to Doug and Todd and Michael for participating. Certainly appreciate you taking the time to tell the stories. And with that, I will say good day to everyone and hopefully we'll see you thanks. for another webinar again soon. Thanks guys. Thanks, thanks Yeah.